Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. If you've been watching my videos, you know that they are intended uh, to provide a fundamental or found foundational understanding of some of the basic principles in microbiology. By no means are they an extensive or exhaustive explanation into, of all the details involved. Uh, at some point we would get lost. Um, for example, today's discussion is going to be on viruses. Well, I took an entire 16-week graduate course on virology, and we still began, just began to scratch the surface. So, since this is a part of a very long semester, and it's only one small part of an exam, we're going to do our best to understand as much as we can in the short time that we have. Um, so, I'm going to provide some foundational or fundamental explanations of the basic principles of virology and viruses. Um, and again, these are not edited. So it's me, a camera, and the board. Whatever comes out, comes out. So we've been discussing a number of microorganisms uh, all semester. And we've talked about archaea a little bit. We've talked about bacteria and um, a bunch of different types of bacteria and bacterial structure and how they are put together. Uh, we have talked about a little bit about protozoa and some of the uh, multicellular organisms that can cause pathology, helminths and other things. Now we're gonna focus primarily on, on viruses. Uh, what are viruses? How are they put together? What are they made of? And basically, how do they function to infect our cells? So, um, first of all, when we begin discussing viruses, the term virus actually literally in Latin means poison. Um, and it comes from uh, a term basically when people were getting ill and they could not figure out what was causing them to get sick, they figured, well, there's some kind of poison or some kind of fluid, contagious fluid that's infecting the body because they couldn't isolate uh, the infectious agent. So they eventually, the scientists began calling them viruses. And uh, it wasn't until like 1935 that the first virus was actually isolated from tobacco. Um, and uh, the, the, the virus that was isolated from tobacco was actually first seen under an electron microscope, which was created shortly after that. And what we realize is that these are very, very, very tiny particles, and they're not cells, they're not alive. So when we look at viruses, um, one of the things we know about viruses, some of the characteristics of virus, uh, viruses, okay, and these are not all of them, but these are just a few, okay, is that viruses are very small. So for example, the average virus or viral particle, a single virion or viral particle, is about somewhere between about 25 to 250 nanometers. Okay, the NM stands for nanometers. Well, if I look at what we call a meter, a meter is a thousand millimeters. One millimeter is a thousand micrometers. And one micrometer is a thousand nanometers. So we usually measure things in millimeters or centimeters or inches and things like that, which there's a conversion. Um, in microbiology, especially in lab, we've looked at things using micrometers, thousandths of a meter, of a millimeter, okay, or a millionth of a meter. So if you took a meter stick, like this one, if I divide into a thousand equal, equal sized units, I have millimeters. If I took one millimeter and divided it into a thousand smaller units, I would have a micro, micrometer or micrometer. And if I took one micrometer and divided it into a thousand smaller units, I would have a nanometer. Or if I took one millimeter and divided it by a billion units, then I would have uh, I would have a nanometer. So I mean these are tiny, 25 to 50 nanometers long uh, in size. Now I'm sorry, looking for my eraser. I gotta find it in my bag here, and I'm trying to hurry so I don't waste any more time. But now. We know that they're very small, and they're about 25 to 250 nanometers. By comparison, bacteria can be somewhere around at the, you know, even the smallest, about 300, I'm sorry, not 300, 3,000 nanometers, okay? 
So, and then the human red blood cell is approximately around 10,000 nanometers. So we're looking at things that are even smaller than some of the bacteria that we're looking at in lab. These are very, very, very tiny things. Very often they can pass through filters and get by based on their size. A couple of other characteristics that we can talk about when we talk about them is that they are not living cells. They are not living, they are not cells. So when we talk about cells, there's two types of cells we can talk about. Prokaryotic cells, which still have a membrane, and they can have a cell wall, um, except for mycoplasmas, and uh, sometimes an outer membrane. But they do have some kind of membrane around them that's made up of a lipid bilayer, and they'll have ribosomes, which are organelles. They have some DNA, and they have cytosol and enzymes and all of these things to perform the functions of life. When we look at eukaryotic cells, they have a nucleus and other membranous organelles, including the cell membrane, um, including mitochondria and Golgi apparatus and endoplasmic reticulum, and they can do protein synthesis and perform all the functions of life. Viruses lack all of that. Viruses are essentially made up of three things, or usually two things sometimes. There's a protein coat, an outer covering that's made out of protein, almost entirely protein only, called a capsid. And the capsid is made up of smaller pieces called capsomeres. Capsomeres are individual subunit proteins that get assembled, and when I put a whole bunch of capsomeres together, I get a capsid. So I can have a bunch of capsomeres, proteins that are made through protein synthesis, and then I can assemble them into some kind of outer covering that would be three-dimensional, that would be the outer co protein coat or the capsid of the uh, virus. Again, a capsid is the outer covering, an entire shell of protein made up of smaller protein subunits called capsomeres. And it is a genome. Well, we know that the genome is the entire genetic makeup of an organism. And that genome can either be DNA, or RNA. And I'm going to put, put it this way because when we look at um, some organism, when we look at prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the genome is always DNA. DNA is that molecule that directs you know, everything that the cell does. The making of mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA, protein synthesis, all of that. But viruses can have DNA as a genome, or they can have RNA as a genome. The other thing we learn is that DNA is usually double-stranded in our cells, but it turns out that viruses can have either double-stranded or single-stranded DNA, and we use the, the designation DS for double-stranded DNA, or SS for single-stranded RNA. So you'll see some viruses designated as a DS DNA virus, that means a double-stranded DNA virus. Or we could say it is an SS DNA virus, a single-stranded DNA. It's just a single strand of DNA instead of two stuck together, like we've learned about the DNA structure before. We can also have double-stranded RNA viruses and single-stranded RNA viruses. Rather than using DNA, they use RNA as their genome. So, these are some of the characteristics that we look at when we look at viruses. We can look at size. We can look at um, the fact that they're not living. They're not cells. There's no cytoplasm. There's no ribosomes. There's no cellular machinery to replicate itself or do protein synthesis or anything. Okay? Those are a couple of the main characteristics that we look at. Okay? Now, Here's what I want to talk about about viruses, just to give us a general overall view of how all viruses seem to work. Okay? Viruses are incapable of replicating themselves without in inserting their genome into another cell. Because they have to enter another cell, or at least insert their genome into another cell, they are called obligate intracellular parasites. So, if I have two organisms, organism A and organism B that lives inside organism A, if they both benefit, if organism A is getting some benefit from organism B and vice versa, 
We say that as a symbiotic relationship. Sim means with and bios means to live to, uh, means to, uh, sorry. Bio means live or life and sim means with, so they live with each other. And some organisms live inside of other organisms and they both benefit. In some instances, organism A might have another organism that lives inside of it and eventually this organism steals this one's nutrients or whatever, harms it and can kill it. When one organism gets an advantage from the relationship at the detriment or harm to the other, we call that a parasitic relationship. Parasites harm the host in which they live. Well, because viruses kill the cells that they live in, and they can only replicate inside the cell, so they must have cellular machinery, they are obligated, and they have to be inside the cell to replicate themselves, intracellular, and because they kill the cells or harm them, they're called parasites. And so we refer to viruses as um, obligate intracellular parasites. And that simply means they have a parasitic relationship with the host cell. The cell in which they live is harmed by the presence of the virus. Just trying to make sure I'm still in the middle of the screen. Okay? So now, how does this work? Well, I'm going to draw a giant cell here. And in this cell membrane, there are some proteins that act like receptors. And there's different types of receptors in the cell membrane. Well, a virus, I'm just gonna draw a specific virus that looks like this with its genome. I'm gonna make the genome of the virus red. I don't know why, it's because it's a color I wanna pick, okay? So, this viral particle is either cruising around in the air or in water or another organism, but somehow, some way, the viral particle can bind to a receptor. And then one of two things can happen. Either A, somehow, some way, especially if this receptor is some kind of protein that has a pore in it or something, it can either inject its genome into the host, its DNA or RNA, or sometimes the host cell will start to invaginate with this membrane and the viral particle inside of it and ingest through endocytosis a piece of the cell membrane plus the viral capsid plus the genome, whatever that is, DNA or RNA. Now in this instance, there's a process called uncoding. And when we uncoat, and we're gonna talk about this later, we basically strip away all the coding and release the viral genome. So either the virus can inject its ge in genome and the capsid never enters the cell, or the capsid and the viral genome can be taken inside the cell and then we uncoat or strip away. And there's a whole process for this and we're not gonna talk about all those details. One way or another, here's the nucleus of my cell with its chromosomes. Somehow, some way, and we're not gonna get into all the gory details, but somehow, some way, the viral genome, if it's viral DNA, can be incorporated into one of the chromosomes of the host cell. And then what it can do is start to express some viral proteins. And some of those enzymes will shut down some of the production of uh, replication and or production of, uh, it'll either shut down replication of the chromosomes or protein synthesis and shut down the cell's normal functioning. And it can make the cell start to make copies, tons of copies of the viral genome. And it can also do transcription and translation of, or protein synthesis of viral proteins. 
So it might run off a messenger RNA, and those mRNAs would go out to ribosomes and start making a bunch of viral proteins. And as it starts to make these viral proteins, the viral proteins can start to assemble into a new viral capsule, or capsid, I should say. And we can insert the viral genome. We can send it out and insert it into the capsid. And so the virus can actually force the host cell to make millions of capsomeres, assemble those into capsids, and then all the copies of the viral genome get inserted, or we essentially assemble new viral particles. And then one of two things can happen. Some viruses Will, will release enzymes that will break the cell membrane open or kill the cell. We say that this is lytic, from the term lice or lysis, to digest. And when the cell lyses, it will release millions of viral particles, which can now go infect new cells. Any cell that has the same receptor will be infected by these new viral particles. And so the viral virus can actually replicate itself. A virus will in, insert its genome or one way or, or uh, uncoat itself, and its genome can be inserted into the cellular genome, and then we can force the cell to stop making cellular DNA and cellular proteins and make viral DNA or viral genome, if it's RNA, and viral proteins, assemble the viral proteins, and then release them one through lysis, or in another instance, the cell can actually start to do what we would call exocytosis. And it could start to bud out and pinch off pieces of its cell membrane, releasing viral particles. And eventually if it does this, I get viral particles that actually have a piece of the host cell membrane around them with their little genome and their capsids. By the way, these happen, this happens to be called the envelope of the virus. If you have a virus that has a viral envelope, the envelope is really just pieces of the original cell membrane with proteins and carbohydrates associated with those, pro, with those lipids. If the virus is released through the lytic cycle, then it's usually an, un an, uh, an unenveloped or what we call a naked virus. And this is kind of the part of the viral life cycle in the sense that a virus will attach to a cell. We call that adsorption. So when we write out the steps of the viral life cycle, we can do it this way. Let me see if I can find a different color that can stand out here. So, when we talk about a viral life cycle, the viral life cycle can occur in a couple of ways, but the main way is if we talk about what's called the lytic cycle, then there are steps. The first step is said to be adsorption. Not absorption, to absorb means to take in, adsorb means to stick to. And this is the first step. In adsorption, it will bind to a receptor, that's my abbreviation for the word receptor, on the, on the membrane of the host cell. The second step is going to be called penetration. The viral genome enters the cell, the host cell, and it can do it one of two ways. It can simply inject its genome or the virus can be taken in and then uncoated. Either way, we refer to part of this as the uncoating. The removal of the protein code. And it turns out that some viruses do have some protein associated with their genome. The next step is going to be called synthesis. Well, to synthesize means to make. And so here it replicates the genome. And synthesizes or makes new viral capsids. 
all the viral proteins. Some viruses have enzymes packaged inside of them. Okay. The next step is going to be called um, maturation. I almost said assembly, but maturation is when we assemble new viral particles. So if we look at this, this would be step two, the uncoding. Step three, I'm sorry, yeah, this would be step two, penetration. Step three would be uncoding. Step four would be the synthesis of viral particles and viral genome. Step five would be maturation, which means putting the genome and the viral particle all together. And then what we're gonna get to is step six, which is called release. And so you can see these six steps and the release can either be through lysis or basically through exocytosis. So adsorption, it binds to a receptor on the membrane of the host cell. Penetration, somehow the virus or the viral genome enters the cell. We have uncoding, which is the removal of the protein coat or capsid. Then we have to have um, synthesis, where we synthesize new viral genome and new viral proteins. Maturation is the assembly of the viral um, genome and proteins together, making a, a complete virion. A virion is an entire virus with the capsid and the protein, or the capsid, the protein, and the envelope. And then the last step would be release. Some people call it bursting and we can rupture the cell through lysis if it enters the lytic cycle, or through exocytosis if they're enveloped viruses, okay? So, you need to know the viral life cycle, you need to know the structure of a virus, that it's just a protein coat called the capsid, and a genome. Some viruses, but not all, also have an envelope. Only enveloped viruses do. By the way, something to note, because the envelope is derived from the host cell membrane, one of the things that does is it helps mask the virus so that the host cell's immune cells don't recognize it because they see the viral capsule, I'm sorry, the viral envelope has the same structures as the, the host cells or the host's own cells. And so the white blood cells of the host very often leave it alone. One of the detriments of enveloped viruses is that uh, a number of things can damage this cell, this membrane. The, the same things that damage the human cell membrane can damage the envelope of viruses, making it easier to break them down. So there's some pros and cons. Now, um, this is essentially how viruses work in order to take over our cells. Now, it's, it's a generic overview of it, but let me go into a little bit more detail on a few things. So I'm going to erase all this. I hope that made sense to you. I hope you can visualize it. And also, if you look this stuff up on YouTube, you'll find lots of cartoons that explain all this stuff. Um, but I don't have the opportunity to do that, nor the brain power. I'm not smart enough to know how to do video cartoons with computer software, okay? So now, um, something I want to go into before we move on to another topic. There are four ways to classify viruses. We always talk about taxonomy. How do we classify bacteria by genus and species? And there's ways to classify bacteria that we didn't really discuss in great detail, but you could look up at how, how closely they are related genetically. But it turns out that you know, we talk about Berge's manual in uh, class sometimes about um, a manual in which bacteria are classified based on how they behave, metabolic activity, um, and a number of other things, which infections they cause, whether they're staining gram-negative versus gram-positive or acid-fast and other things. Um, when it comes to viruses, viruses are classified in a number of ways. One way is based on size, okay? And so some viruses are classified based on size, and we're not gonna go into detail because we're not really gonna look at that. 
A second way that viruses can be classified is based on their structure. How are they put together? And really, there's kind of three ways that we can look at them, okay? One is their genome. What is their genome made of, okay? And again, we've talked a little bit about this previously. My blue marker is dying, and I don't know if I have another good blue marker. Let me walk over here and see if I do. This one's okay. That one's not very good. That one's okay. So, sorry to walk off screen and do that to you, but my blue marker was dying, and I was going to try to continue to write in blue. But when we look at the genome, it can be DNA, so we have DNA viruses or RNA viruses. So some viral genomes are made entirely of DNA, some viral genomes are made of RNA. And then another way we can look at them is are they single-stranded, which is usually abbreviated as SS, or are they double-stranded? which is abbreviated as DS. So we can look at how viruses um, are categorized based on their genome. And so there are whole categories of viruses that are um, classified as single-stranded DNA viruses and double-stranded DNA viruses. You can have double-stranded RNA viruses and you can have single-stranded RNA viruses. The SS is all, and DS is always lowercase and the DNA or RNA is always uppercase. So we have double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, double-stranded RNA viruses, and single-stranded RNA viruses. It's a way that we can classify them based on their genome. And there are four, these four major classifications. We're gonna go into a little bit of detail of specific viruses that fall under each category and what pathology do they cause, okay? So we can, we can look at their genome Another way we can look at them is at their capsid structure. What does the capsid look like? There are three major categories, okay? Uh, one category is helical. So helical capsids are made out of helical proteins that eventually interlock. And so we can make all these little proteins that will interlock and make these long sort of like thin tubes. To me, they almost look like little cylinders. And inside of there would be the DNA or the genome running through here, okay? So we call those helical viruses because there's helical proteins that interlock and form this little tube-like um, capsid. There are what we call polyhedral. So polyhedral refers to things like when we talk about uh, uh, a pentagon or um, a hexagon or an octagon, octahedral, pentahedral. So polyhedral simply refers to the geometric shapes. Okay. Very often, some of the proteins are somewhat triangular, and we can start to put all these little triangular proteins together like this. And I know, I think you've seen those little kind of plastic ball type things that are a bunch of triangular uh, uh, things stuck together that you can expand and collapse. And so these, these viruses end, end on taking up shapes that look somewhat rounded or what we would call a hexagon shape or a hexahedral or really we would call them an icosahedron because there's actually 20 sides in the three dimension, not just six. And inside of here would be the genome, okay? And then there are complex viruses. When we talk about their capsid, a complex capsid is a combo. It's a combination of the two. One famous class are called some of the phage viruses, like the T4 phage. Um, when we talk about phage, phage comes from the term, and I'm gonna put it in parentheses, bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are viruses that only infect bacteria and not other types of cells. One famous bacteriophage is called the T4 phage, and the head part looks like it's polyhedral. And then it has a, it has a um, helical portion that is referred to as the tail. 
And then on this one, it actually has a tail plate, another protein structure. And it actually has these things that look like little legs called tail fibers. And it even has these little spike proteins called tail pins. And they will attach to a bacterial cell and then attach the uh, spikes or tail pins and then inject their genome. So that would be a complex virus. It's one of the most famous and creepy or eerie looking ones. Some of the electron micrographs that you might see might show viruses that look either uh, helical or roundish or polyhedral, but the phage viruses really are kind of cool looking. Uh, you might want to look some up, okay? Just to see how cool viruses look under the electron microscope. If you want to, you can go and your favorite search engine and look up electron micrograph virus and it'll show you a bunch of cool images that they've taken using an electron microscope, pictures taken through an electron microscope of viruses. So of the four ways that we classify viruses, we've only covered you know two so far. One is the size, which we really didn't discuss, but some are tiny, some are bigger. The structure, and we can look at the structure of the genome. Is it DNA or RNA? Is it single-stranded or double-stranded? The capsid, is it helical? Is it polyhedral or is it a complex virus that combines the two? Um, another way that we can classify viruses is, oh, and another, by the way, one last thing I should say about um, the capsid, um, uh, or another way that we can look at them is, do they have an envelope? Um, so we have what are called enveloped or enveloped viruses and naked viruses. And as I stated a minute ago, an enveloped virus is one that has a piece of the host cell membrane outside of its capsid. Naked viruses don't have any membrane outside the capsid. So those are the structural ways that we can classify viruses. Um, are they single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA? Um, what is the capsid shape? Are they a helical virus? Uh, are they uh, polyhedral viruses? Are they complex viruses? And are they enveloped or not? Do they have an envelope or are they a naked virus? Okay. So those are the two, two of the four major ways that we can classify viruses. Size, structure, we can look at the structure of the genome, the structure of the capsid, and are they, uh, do they have an envelope or not? A third way that we can classify uh, viruses is on what we call the host range. What are the range of host cells? So. Whatever organism is infected by a virus is called the host. Um, and if it's a particular cell within an organism, then we call that the host cell. For example, um, we know that the, uh, what we call COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 virus, actually infects a particular cell in the lung called a type 2 pneumocyte. So type 2 pneumocytes in your lungs are the host cell for that virus. So some viruses only infect a specific type of bacterium and we would call those you know, a specific type of phage virus. So what is the host that is infected by the virus determines how we can classify some viruses. For example, phage infect bacteria and um, non-phage viruses infect other cells. Um, and uh, I think I'm gonna stop with that. What is the host that infect? Well, uh, let me say one other thing. Some viruses, because the proteins in the capsid of the virus are designed or will bind to a specific receptor, some viruses have one specific cell to which they bind and that's it. So they have a very limited host range. Some can bind, bind to a number of hosts um, and some can even bind to host cells in more than one species. For example, um, some of the more recent viruses that are causing infections in humans can affect and infect cells in more than one organism. We're not going to get in a lot of detail there, but nonetheless. So, a fourth way that we can categorize viruses is based on their life cycle. Well, we just went over that. Is it lytic? Does it digest the cell? Or another way, another way that we can look at some viruses is that we say that they are lysogenic. And 
These, ex these show what we call temperance. And lysogenic is in, back, in, is in phage. If it's a phage and it's lysogenic, um, or if it infects virals, oh, sorry. if the virus infects bacteria, we can, and it, it undergoes what we call temperance, it's called lysogenic. It's called latent in animal cells. If I could spell, Okay, so lysogenic and latent mean the same thing. They show what we call temperance. Tem to temper oneself means to hold yourself back from something. So they can either be lytic or they can be temperant or lysogenic. We would say latent if we were talking about animal cells. Well, what do I mean here? Okay, let me explain. In a lytic virus, we saw a minute ago what happens. The virus will infect the cell, it will replicate the virus and assemble the virus, and then it will lyse the host cell and release the, the, um, the new viral particles. In some instances, I can have a virus bind to a cell, inject its genome, and then what can happen is, if I have the chromosomes of the host cell here, The viral genome can be inserted into the host cell's genome and then stop replicating the virus. It sits here what we say dormant or doing nothing, so to speak, in viral terms. But what happens is, as the cell replicates, if this cell undergoes mitosis, not only will it copy its own DNA, but when it divides by mitosis, the daughter cell will also have not only all the normal DNA on all its chromosomes, it will also replicate the viral DNA. And as this cell divides and divides and divides and divides, all the daughter cells and all the generations of cells that stem from this infected cell will also have the viral genome uh, in its cell. Later on, for some reason, some stressor, for example, like um, with what we call uh, Fever blisters. If someone gets too much UV light exposure or when you get a fever and you're sick, people can start to get little sores on their lip that we call a cold sore from the herpes simplex virus one. Well, that virus is lying dormant in your nerves and your neurons, but when you become stressed, exhausted, overworked, too much stress, too much UV light exposure, um, you have a fever, you can start to express the virus, the virus will actually cause itself, well, the stressor somehow, some way turns on the viral lytic cycle. And now, instead of lying here dormant, it will activate the lytic cycle where it will start to um, form viral particles, uh, viral capsids, replicate the viral genome, assemble them, and then initiate lysis and rupture the cell. So really, the only difference between lytic and lysogenic is that a lytic virus actually infects the cell and lyses the cell. A lysogenic virus has the ability to generate or kick off to make the lytic cycle happen under special conditions. And while it's not uh, lysing the host cell, it lies dormant and gets its viral genome replicated with the host cell's genome. So lysogenic means it can generate the lytic cycle under special conditions. While it's not doing that, it lies dormant, okay? So that's the difference between lysogenic and lytic. And again, if it were, if it were infecting animal cells, we call it a latent virus. The virus lies there and waiting for its latent period, and then it will express itself, okay? I hope that makes sense. So those are four ways that we can classify viruses, size, the structure of the genome, the structure of the capsid, or whether it has an envelope or not. We can do it basically based on whether they are enveloped or naked and based on their life cycle. Are they lytic or lysogenic latent um, viruses, okay? Now, <clears throat> we've covered quite a bit of information in a short period of time. Um, 
We've gone over the lytic cycle. Um, I want to talk about some, some very specific viruses um, that are important in, the patho in, in generating pathology in humans, some very important pathogenic viruses in humans. This is not all of them, but this is a nice little handful and kind of an overview of some important ones, okay? And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over them based on their genetic structure, okay? Now, let me take a quick drink. <clears throat> My voice is getting hoarse. The first group I wanna talk about is the double-stranded DNA viruses, and we're gonna abbreviate them as DSDNA. Double-stranded DNA viruses kind of work the way that we just expressed or that we just talked about. Um, because they're double-stranded DNA genome of this, because the genome of these viruses is a double-stranded piece of DNA, um, it can insert itself into the host DNA using restriction enzymes as we discussed in a previous um, lecture. And once it's incorporated, uh, it can either be replicated or activate the lytic cycle, okay? And their, the viral DNA works very much like the human DNA in that you know we have two strands, we can start to separate them and copy them, or we can open up one strand and do transcription translation, as we've discussed in previous lectures. Okay? And then there are single-stranded DNA viruses. Now, in a single-stranded DNA viruses, these are somewhat similar, um, but essentially what they do is they insert a single strand of DNA and then we then will use some host enzymes, DNA polymerase in particular. And uh, if you go back and you review DNA replication, the enzyme that can copy a strand of DNA is DNA polymerase. And it will use um, the base pairing rule, Chargoff's rule of base pairing. And with DNA polymerase and the base pairing rule, it will make a copy of that strand. When it separates these, then what it can do is replicate another strand and another strand and separate them and keep copying and copying itself. It can even use a single strand for, pro for protein synthesis, transcription and translation. So um, they work similarly to double-stranded DNA molecules, but they are only made up of a single strand of DNA. Now, some DNA viruses that are really important, okay, um, this is what I really want to focus on. Some pathogenic DNA viruses. And I'm really going to try to focus on the viruses that are pathogenic to humans. Okay. Um, there's kind of a way I try to remember this. You know, I, I always like to tell my students, I'm not that smart. Uh, although I'm pretty smart, I know a lot of stuff, but I'm dumb in some areas. But I'm not smart enough to be able to memorize the phone book, so I have to come up with simplified ways to remember things, and I like to share those with my students. And so I use this little acronym, or this silly way. I took several DNA viruses that were important when I was a student, and I used this little, and I, I refer to it as HAPPIES. Like, huh, happies. And basically, when I would say huh, happies, it sounds really dumb, but my classmates would, what the heck are you talking about? Well, the huh, ha is the two H's, the A, and three P's, okay? And this helps us learn some of the viruses. Now, there's one group called hepatinoviruses, or sometimes we can say something viruses, or you'll see it listed as something viridi. Okay, it's the same thing. Hepatinoviruses and hepatinoviridae, they're kind of used interchangeably. Hepatinoviruses or hepatinoviridae. Well, you can remember this, okay? One of the things we know about them is that they are double-stranded DNA viruses. Another thing that we know about them is, if you think of your anatomy and physiology, Hepato means liver, like the hepatotoxin and the hepatic artery, hepatic vein. So hepatinoviruses um, can cause hepatitis. One particular type is hepatitis B that is caused by our hepatoviruses or hepatinoviruses. Um, now, 
The other H we can talk about is the herpes viruses or herpes viridae. Okay. Herpes viruses are also double-stranded DNA viruses. Now, you've heard of herpes. Uh, lots of people have heard of it. There's several herpes viruses, and they are all designated as HSV, which stands for herpes. They're not all designated this way, but herpes simplex virus. Okay, let me see if I'm writing off the edge of the board there. I'm right at the edge of the board, so let me swing the camera over a little bit. I apologize for any movement. But herpes simplex virus, or HSV, well, one of them is called HSV-1. This is one that lies latent in our nervous system and can be expressed as cold sores. So we refer to these as fever blisters or cold sores. There's HSV-2, which is we call genital herpes. So herpes simplex 1 would cause little cold sores on the mouth. Sometimes they call that the kissing herpes, and this is a little bit more than kissing. The genital herpes is one that's sexually transmitted and can cause sores on the genitalia, and that's caused by HSV2. There's another one called EBV, which stands for Epstein, and it's actually capitalized because it's somebody's last name, Epstein-Barr virus, okay? The Epstein-Barr virus, I forget if there's an E on it. Actually, let me look. I've seen this a million times. Why am I forgetting? Yeah, it's no E. Epstein-Barr virus um, is what we also know as mononucleosis. Mononucleosis is when you're, you have massive activation of monocytes and the lymph nodes. So people get very swollen lymph nodes in their armpits or all throughout the body, become very exhausted, and you know, just don't feel well, can run fever for a long time, and it's very debilitating. And then there's v, uh, VZV, which stands for uh, varicella zoster virus. Varicella is chickenpox. This is the virus that causes chickenpox. So these are several herpes viruses or that belong to the, the family of herpes viruses, HSV-1, HSV-2, Epstein-Barr, and the varicella virus, okay? Um, I think those are the ones I wanna focus on. So I'm gonna erase these, but you can see that when we go through our HH, hepatinoviruses affect hepatology or hepatitis, that's the hepatitis B virus. Herpes viruses do the two herpes, and then um, chicken pox and Epstein-Barr or mononucleosis. Okay, you just gotta remember those. I'm not sure of a funky way to remember them. I just remember them. They're all related, okay? The next group would be called adenoviruses, or actually it's pronounced adenoviruses or adenoviridae, okay? These are uh, double-stranded DNA viruses as well. Now, one of the things we know about adenoviruses is that they cause uh, cold-like symptoms or flu-like symptoms, okay? So sometimes you have sort of a, like a head cold or a cold or flu-like symptoms, but you can't really pinpoint it. It's not necessarily the flu virus. It's not influenza. Um, then a lot of times it can be an adenovirus and causes a lot of illnesses. Now, the first one of the P's is the pox viridae. Now this will confuse some people, but Pox, if you think of chicken pox as little skin lesions, pox viridae um, are also double-stranded DNA viruses and they cause skin lesions. They can also sometimes cause fatigue or what we call general malaise and they can cause um, fever and other symptoms. But the pox viridae, one of the, uh, they can cause skin lesions. One of the most famous ones is one called cow pox. We've talked about it early in the semester when we talked about the smallpox epidemic and how the first vaccine, vaca, cow in Spanish, was uh, used because you know milk maidens that milked cows had little lesions called cowpox, and they didn't get smallpox, and so they used the cowpox um, pus from cow, cowpox lesions to infect people with cowpox so that they didn't get smallpox. I'd rather have cowpox and be, be a little bit ugly than have smallpox and be killed, the plague. 
So um, the pox viridae can cause them. There's not a lot that infect humans, but there's a few. One of them would be cowpox, and they cause skin lesions. You should know that, okay? Um, uh, yeah, I, really, I don't think I want to go into it. But do remember, this is not chicken pox. Chicken pox is caused by um, the varicella zoster virus, okay? Um, the next P is going to be parvovirus. Now, if you uh, are parvoviruses, these are the only ones that are single-stranded DNA, okay? I don't know how I remember that. I just do. Now, um, this causes parvo in dogs. So uh, you, if, you, if you have a dog and you get your dog uh, vaccinated, one of the vaccines is for the parvo virus so that your dogs don't get sick and can kill them sometimes. The last P is the papoviruses, okay? And I save this one for last for a reason. So the papoviridae or the papoviruses. Well, I think of this as this. The PA stands for a papilloma. And you've heard of the HPV vaccine, which stands for human papilloma virus vaccine. Well, anytime you see this term, I'm running out of room, but OMA refers to a tumor or growth. So a lymphoma is a tumor of a lymph node. A carcinoma are tumors of the of skin. Um, adenomas are tumors of the adenoids. So anytime you see OMA, you think tumors. And that's not a very pretty way to write OMA, but nonetheless, let me erase this. I'm a little bit erratic today because I got a lot to cover in a short period of time. And so, and I also have somewhere that I have to be, and I'm out of time to prepare this material for students. But the human papilloma, you've heard of this because um, the human papilloma virus can cause cervical cancer. And so now you can get a vaccine against the virus that can cause cervical cancer. There are different types of cervical cancer, but one type that we know of can be caused by the papilloma virus or the human papilloma virus. And so I think of papoviridae as the tumor viruses, and the pa is for papilloma, and literally the po is for what we call a polyoma. Polyoma means many tumors. So there are some viruses called polyoma viruses, and they cause uh, polyomas or many tumors. One polyoma uh, virus can cause uh, tumors that affect the kidneys and cause kidneys disease. Some can infect the brain. So I think of the papoviruses as the papilloma polyoma viruses or the tumor viruses. One causes cervical cancer. Another one can cause cancer of the kidneys, okay? Um, or the brain as well. Um, so if you think of the DNA viruses, I think of uh, DNA makes me happy. Hepatinoviruses, HEPA, liver diseases, hepatitis B. The second H is herpes, herpes simplex one and two, Epstein-Barr, and um, varicella. Adenoviruses cause colds, pox viridae cause pox like a cow pox. Parvoviruses are the only single-stranded ones, and they're the only ones we're not talking about human diseases. They cause parvo in dogs. And the papoviridae, papilloma and polyomas, the tumor viruses, okay? That's an easy way to remember them. So if someone ever asks you which virus can cause um, uterine tumors or uterine cancer, that would be the papoviridae and the papilloma virus. Or which one can cause kidney or brain cancers, that's the polyomas, which is part of the papoviridae. Which which viruses would cause parvo in dogs? Well, parvoviridae. Which one uh, could cause skin lesions like pox? Poxviridae. Adenoviruses. So if you think about when you get a cold, you get swelling in your adenoids, your, some of your lymph nodes. Herpes viruses are the kissing and the sexual viruses. Um, and I guess you could think of Epstein and Barr hooked up and got herpes um, or varicella. So. That might be a simple way to remember it. And then hepatinoviruses do hepatitis, the kidneys, okay? I'm sorry, the liver, liver diseases. All right, so those are all of our DNA viruses, both double-stranded and single-stranded. 
If you remember that the DNA viruses make you happies, then you can remember the only one that's different is the parvo, and that's in dogs, and it's single-stranded, at least for the viruses that we're going to cover. Now, finally, the last thing I want to go over are some single-stranded viruses, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, not single-stranded, some RNA viruses. So when we look at RNA viruses, RNA viruses are um, a little bit unique. First of all, they're made of, their genome is RNA. Um, and when we talk about RNA viruses, we can talk about what's called positive sense RNA. Positive sense RNA, one of the ways I think of it is ribosomes can read messenger RNA, correct? And they make messenger, they make sense out of the mRNA and build a protein. So positive sense virus RNA viruses simply means that um, they can be used for transcription directly. The ribosome can make sense of this and transcribe it and translate it, or I shouldn't say transcription. They can be used directly for translation. They're already transcribed, okay? So, positive sense RNA viruses can be used directly for translation, meaning the ribosome can read it, it can make sense of it. If it is a negative sense RNA virus, then it cannot be used directly for transcription. And, in a, and these viruses, they use an enzyme which is called reverse transcriptase. And RNA viruses can use reverse transcriptase to go from RNA, if I have an RNA molecule, I can actually use the enzyme reverse transcriptase to read this and add the opposite DNA bases using the base pairing rule. So I can go reverse from RNA, because usually in cells we go DNA to RNA to protein to the function, right? And we call that the central dogma. But in this since they have to go backwards or in reverse to DNA, then they make their RNA, then they can do protein synthesis and perform the functions. So they use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to do the opposite of transcription. Transcription is usually when we rewrite DNA in the messenger RNA, reverse transcriptase turns RNA into DNA, and then we can use that to make copies of the RNA and uh, messenger RNAs. So when we talk about a negative sense RNA, they cannot be read directly by the ribosome. We actually have to go back and make positive sense RNA. So um, I'm gonna stop there before I get too far down the road. Now, <clears throat> it's hard to know where to stop with this stuff because there's just so much I wish I could tell you. It's such cool stuff. Anyway, um, we're gonna talk about a couple of RNA viruses. Um, so, some single-stranded RNA viruses. Do I wanna start with single-stranded? Let's start with double-stranded and get them out of the way because they're easier and fewer that we're gonna discuss, okay? The double-stranded RNA viruses. These have two strands of RNA. Um, and essentially, what happens is, as they, when, as they are utilized, the two strands can be separated and one strand can be used to make copies of the other strand and vice versa. And then they can use um, those strands to go in and make their proteins. They can transcribe one of the two strands like a positive sense RNA virus uh, or a positive sense piece of RNA. Now, um, I think one of the main ones, the only one I really want you guys to know is there's a class of these called rheoviruses, and one of the main ones is called a rotavirus. And if you've ever had a baby that has a rotavirus or a kid, or if you ever get it, it what it basically causes is it causes massive diarrhea. A very loose 
and very foul smelling um, type of diarrhea. And so rotaviruses are real common, humans get them, you get really bad diarrhea and you get sick for a while and then it passes and your body will clear it. So that's the only double-stranded RNA virus that I want to talk about, which is the rotaviruses and you'll see those a lot when you do um, pediatric rotations. For single-stranded RNA viruses, there's quite a few that we can talk about, okay? So single-stranded RNA viruses. There's several classes I want to mention. Um, and um, some of them are positive sense, some of them are negative sense, but it doesn't matter right now. Um, one of the first ones I want to talk about is what we call the retroviruses or retroviridae. And the most common one is what we call HIV, which stands for um, human immunodeficiency oops, virus, HIV. This virus leads to what we call AIDS. AIDS stands for acquired immunodeficiency, if I could spell, syndrome. Now a syndrome is when you have a whole bunch of types of illnesses that are always seen together as a group. And so when AIDS was first discovered, it was because people were showing up having a, a whole series of similar illnesses, some pneumonia and some other um, upper respiratory infections and other illnesses. And what happened was it was discovered that their immune system was deficient and they had to acquire this. And it later on was discovered that it was acquired through human fluid contacts, either sharing an IV needle or using a contaminated needle or through um, body fluids like in intercourse and other things. So acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS results from this virus. This is a series of illnesses and, and um, symptoms that occur together, like a low white blood cell. And essentially, HIV infects human T cells. T cells, we haven't covered uh, immunology yet, but are some of our white blood cells that can get involved in fighting infections directly, T lymphocytes. And HIV infects those T, those T lymphocytes and kills them off. And as they all die off, you have no immune system or you have a very weakened immune system and now all the things that we're fighting off daily make you sick. So you get the flu, you get pneumonia, you get all sorts of other little illnesses that our body is, our immune system is used to fighting off, but without the immune system, we get infected with everything. So one of the main retroviruses is called HIV, okay? Human immunodeficiency virus. Um, I think that's the, the major one that I want to talk about for that, that group. There's another group called rhabdoviruses. And I think of rhabdo sounds like or almost has the word rabies in it. This virus is the virus that causes what we call rabies. And it can be carried um, by animals um, when you get bitten by, say, a dog that's rabid or some other animal. Um, another ma major group is called the Phyloviridae. Now, the phyloviridae, um, there's two major ones that I want to discuss. One is called the Ebola virus and what we call the Marburg virus. Okay, and these cause what is very often commonly referred to as hemorrhagic fevers. But there's two different viruses that can cause this. Well, hemorrhagic refers to hemorrhage, and hemo means blood. So this is massive internal bleeding, and this virus will break down a lot of internal organs. The Ebola virus can even break down the brain and cause blood to drip from people's ears and nose, as well as the bleed from the mouth and the anus. They bleed from every orifice because the Ebola virus just starts destroying all the internal organs. Marburg virus is very sim sim similar 
um, and has very similar symptoms. And so they cause what we call hemorrhagic fevers, very high fevers and lots of internal bleeding or lots of hemorrhaging from internal organs, okay? And then the last group I wanna talk about is called the Flavi Viridae. These are all single-stranded RNA viruses. These cause a number of different diseases, or I think there's a number of flavors of these. Uh, it's not really a great way to think of it. So I'm gonna erase these others, and I'm gonna move Flaviviridae up because there's three or four I wanna talk about, and we will wrap up our discussion of viruses for now. We've already discussed them earlier in the semester. We repeated some information today But the flavivirity, okay? There's a bunch of these. When we say something is something born with an E, that means it, it's born of or comes from that. So when I talk about the mosquito-borne versions, the mosquito-borne flavivirity are transmitted to humans by mosquito bites. Um, one of them we know of is called dengue fever. Dengue fever causes fever, it can cause rash, it can cause nausea and vomiting. It has a number of symptoms. Almost all of these have very similar symptoms, okay? Fever, aches, pains, rash. Um, but dengue fever is sort of uh, one that has got when you go into the, into a, say, a, you're infected by a mosquito in a sort of a very tropical climate, lots of jungles, okay? One is called yellow fever. These come from specific types of flavivirity. Yellow fever is called yellow fever. It has very similar symptoms to dengue fever. Fever, aches, pains, and chills. But one of the things that um, it can cause, in addition to aches and pains and fever, is these little um, quotation marks means we're just bringing these words down. It can cause jaundice. And if you remember from your a &P, jaundice comes from a yellowing of the tissues. And so because the liver starts getting damaged, people can start to develop jaundice and end up with what we call yellow fever. Um, another one is called West Nile virus because it came from the Western Nile region in Africa. Um, West Nile virus also causes the same symptoms aches, pains, and fever, but it causes what we call encephalitis. Again, if you remember your A&P, cephal means head, and means inside, and so it causes inflammation of the brain and the meninges. It can also lead to um, confusion, headaches, nausea, vomiting, um, and even lead to death. Um, can lead people to go into a coma because it's affecting the brain. And another one that can cause almost the exact same symptoms, but it's caused by a different one, is called the Zika virus. So um, there's the dengue virus, there's the yellow fever virus, West Nile virus, and the Zika virus, which is also named for an area in Africa, as far as I understand. And the Zika virus has very similar symptoms to West Nile virus. So all of these cause fever, aches, pains, uh, general malaise, and then yellow fever causes jaundice, the yellowing of tissues. West Nile virus and Zika virus cause encephalitis. They cause inflammation of the brain and um, the meninges, okay? Almost uh, all flavor viruses that we're interested in are mosquito-borne, but there's one that is not, and I'm gonna put a little asterisk here, and it's called tick-borne encephalitis. Tick-borne encephalitis is an encephalitis that comes from a tick bite. And it's a type of flavivirity that ticks can carry and transmit to humans. Um, there was another one I was going to talk about called Japanese encephalitis, which is a, associated with one of these groups, but um, we could really go on for days and days and days. And I'm not going to go over any more. So these are the viruses that I want my students to be familiar with. And I want you to start seeing that um, really the overall goal here is for you guys to understand what viruses are made of. A capsid, protein coat, 
and a genome, DNA or RNA. The genome can be single-stranded or double-stranded, whether it's DNA or RNA. If it is an enveloped virus, then it has a membrane around it that comes from the host cell membrane because they are released almost similar to exocytosis. You need to know the viral life cycle or the lytic cycle of viruses. Not all viruses are lytic, so you should know the difference between lytic, ones that directly lyse the cell. You should know the steps, which would be adsorption, they bind to, penetration, enter, um, uncoating, removing the capsid so that we have the genome, synthesis, copying and copying the, the genome and synthesizing the proteins for the capsid, maturation, which means we assemble the capsid and put the genome in it, and then release. Those are the steps, you should know those. If it's lysogenic, that means it enters the host cell and then lies dormant in the host cell's genome and gets replicated that way. And some stressor can generate the lytic cycle later on and then it can, can become lytic. And again, those that are enveloped are released through uh, exocytosis. I want you to know that, that viruses are classified based on one, their size, two, structure, either the structure of the genome, the structure of the capsid, is it um, helical, is it polyhedral, or is it complex? Is it enveloped or not? Um, the host range, which organisms does it infect? Because this is a, a, a microbiology class for health science majors, I'm focusing on, focusing on humans, not all the other organisms that can be infected. Um, and then uh, they are also classified by their life cycle. And then I want you to know a few of the major viruses that cause pathogenicity or uh, pathology in humans um, that are either DNA viruses, and we went over the Hahapis, they're all double-stranded except for Parvo, and then the name kind of tells you which ones are which, and then the single-stranded viruses. Um, I mean, sorry, the RNA viruses. And uh, there's only like one double-stranded RNA virus that we weren't worried about. Those are the rotaviruses, which cause diarrhea, and the rest are all single-stranded RNA viruses. Um, and we talked about some major groups. So um, the last detail I wanna talk about, and I'm gonna do it very briefly because these are very poorly understood. There is a class of pathogenic organisms, or I wouldn't even say organisms, but um, things called viroids. These are not viruses. They have no capsid. It is simply what we call infectious RNA. Somehow, some way, there's some RNA that can cruise around in the universe and enter some cells and cause pathology. Um, they are two things I want you to know. They are poorly understood. Okay, that's why we're not going to talk about them any much any longer. And so far, we know that they affect plants. As far as we know, the only viroids that are really infectious infect plant cells, and they can cause devastation to certain plant populations. Um, and they are simply some RNA that can get into a cell somehow without a capsid and um, wreak havoc. The last class I want to talk about are called prions. Now this isn't everything, but the other ones you're not going to really deal with a whole lot. You really won't even deal with prions a whole bunch. Prions are infectious proteins. There is no genome. They are proteins that somehow get inside cells and do damage. Um, one of them that we are familiar with, or one disease, is mad cow disease. And mad cow disease is a disease that's caused by a prion that gets into the brain of cows and eats away their brain and causes encephalitis and kills them. And in humans, it is called Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Okay. Creutzfeldt Jakob disease is similar to mad cow in that it is an encephalitis of humans. And it can eat up a human brain and will kill a person. It will literally put you in a coma, eat away your brain, and kill you. And it's thought to be caused by a prion, just some infectious protein. That's all that I want you to know about them. If I ask you about prions, they're infectious proteins that cause encephalitis in cows as mad cow disease and Creutzfeldt-Jacob disease, and that should be Jacob 
as in like an A, like the name Jacob, okay? So, name for two scientists who discovered it. That's everything that I want y'all to know about viruses for my class, or at least for the beginning. We're gonna go into them in more detail as we do immunology. We'll go more into bacteria when we talk about antimicrobial agents and the human immune system and how we fight infections. So, I hope you learned something. Um, I apologize for being so rambling or jumbling and, and crazy in my thoughts in the sense that I didn't have a lot of time to prep for this because I'm up against a deadline and I just walked in and started going over stuff and I'm trying to filter out as I'm talking tons of information because you could literally memorize hundreds and hundreds of viruses like you could do hundreds and hundreds of bacteria that cause disease and nobody can memorize all that so I wanted to give you a few of the major ones. I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.